welcome to Anchored Hope Church. How's everybody doing this morning? Everybody's rested from Memorial Day weekend. You're all recovered. You're all good. You got your, you got your, your boating out of, out of the way. You had your camping weekend. You're all good. You're all rested. You just been, I think May should be relabeled like birthday and celebration month. Like the, you guys have so many parties every weekend that I have to attend. It's quite momentous and I'm very sunburnt. Uh, but I'm so glad to be with you this morning, either in person or online. I'm Michael Davis. I'm one of the pastors here at Anchored Hope Church. And I would love to stay connected with you guys. Um, we have a text in church number. Um, we would love it if you would text hi to the number on the screen. Or if you're watching online, it's going to be down below me here somewhere. Uh, but we would love it if you'd text that number and just say, hi, we're so glad that you're here um, and somebody's going to be in touch with you. Also, we have a text to give number um, as well, or you can go to anchoredhope.church forward slash give um, and you can give online. We don't pass an offering basket or anything like that. We want you guys to have a good experience. This isn't a shakedown, um, but we would just love it if you would be generous and provide life-changing opportunities for somebody else. And I'll tell you what some of those life-changing experiences look like that are coming up, um, not this Wednesday, but next, the 16th, we have our mobile food market. Um, we've been helping over 200 families um, every second Wednesday of the month at our mobile food market, and we've just got our contract extended out. We partner with um, STL Food Bank, and so we're going to be able to continue that for the rest of the year, which is awesome that the funding is still going to be there to be able to help us do that. And so, yeah, that's awesome, right? And so we're going to be able to help those that are in need through that. And then we have a lot of other cool things coming up, like VBS. Um, at the end of this month, we're going to have VBS, and it's going to be a one-night event instead of a week-long or a couple-day event. It's going to be a one-night event on a Saturday. And uh, we chose this because we wanted to provide an even better experience for our kids. Our worship band is going to be here to do a concert for the kids. Kona Ice is coming. We're going to have free snow cones uh, for the kids and the parents. And so we're going to have a big party here at the church. Church. And so you guys can find out more about that on Facebook or our website, anchoredhope.church. Um, but I do want to uh, remind you to register your kids as soon as possible so that we can plan ahead a little bit. Um, and Pastor Kerry's still looking for volunteers as well to help with that. So we would love if you guys would be a part of that. Um, and then we've got much, much more coming up this summer that we're excited to announce. Uh, but we'll save that for a later time. So uh, at this time, our band's going to come up. We're going to sing some songs together. Would you guys stand this morning? We've got a short worship video for you this morning before we get started, but go ahead and stand this morning as we prepare for worship.
Oh 
this morning as we pray, you know, we've talked about this before. This is, a, this is an opportunity for you to have a conversation with God, to come to your Father in heaven, to tell him what's on your heart and mind, but to recognize, too, that, that he already knows. He's seen what you've gone through this week. He knows what you felt. He's been there with you the entire time. And so more than that, even it's a time for us to surrender our will to God, to align our will with his. And as we talk about something that I've kind of found has been on all of our hearts and minds, that we would just, we would just let everything all of our defenses down and that God would just speak to us in a very real way today. So would you bow your heads with me? Father God, we, we, we come to you today. Father God, you, you've seen everything that we've gone through this week. You know how we felt. You know what we've been through. You know what we've, we've witnessed. You've, you've been there during the lows and you've been there during the highs. Father God, this morning, would you just speak to us in a very real way? Would we leave here changed? Would we leave here renewed? As we begin to study and look at the return that your son Jesus made, the return that he promised to us that would come, God, would you, would you challenge us? Would you force us to have difficult conversations? Would you, would you force us to ask questions, to, to think on things? And God, would you, would you just do something new in us? Because God, I, I truly believe that, that what we believe, what we think of you has real implications in, on this earth, has real implications on your, your kingdom coming to this earth. So would you just do something in our minds and hearts this morning, Lord? We thank you, God, and we pray these things in your name. Well, hey, I am so glad that you guys are here, whether you're watching online or in person. Would you turn to somebody next to you and just say, hey, I'm so glad you're here. And if you're watching online, would you tell us where you're watching from? Tell us hi in the comment section. We're so glad you guys are here. And then we're going to go ahead and dismiss all of our kids. All of our kids up to fifth grade are going to go back to the back to our awesome children's department. They're going to go have some fun back there with Pastor Wes. And didn't our band do a great job leading us in worship this morning? It's always good to be waked up with some worship jams, right? And some awesome coffee. Did everybody get some good coffee here this morning at the Anchored, Anchored Brew Cafe? Yeah? Awesome. Good. Well, then you should be you should be so ready for this series then, because this morning we are going to be, begin a brand new series called The End. And we are going to be talking about the end of times for the next couple weeks. And some of you are thinking, are you out of your mind? And let me tell you, I've asked myself that question multiple times over the last few weeks. But we are going to take a look at this and we're going to study about the end times, the end of the world. We're going to have some fun conversations and get some fun, fun conversations going. And, you know, I've realized you guys know, I mean, I usually have like cool graphics and bumper videos and stuff. Because anytime I'm, I'm working on a series or an idea, I go shopping for like graphics and cool videos and stuff. And let me tell you something. There aren't any out there. Because nobody is talking about this. Because nobody is as stupid as me to bring up this conversation. And you'll find out a little bit why. But we're going to get into all of that. But we're going we're to have some conversation. Because, you know, I found, especially this week, as I've kind of been promoing and talk about, like, hey, here's my next series. Here's what we're going to talk about. I received an overwhelming number of messages from people who don't even go here to Anchored Hope Church. Friends that I, friends that I went to college with. People who don't even live in the state of Missouri who said, man, I'm so glad you're talking about this because I, I'm so anxious about this. Like this has been something that's been on my heart and been on my mind. And so I'm glad you're talking about this. And people have sent me, you know, links to books and articles and all kinds of cool stuff. And that's what I love about our community that's, you know, not just here in Troy, but that's, you know, been able to go online. And there's just so many people impacted by this, but it seems that so many people are so interested about this conversation. And the reason I think that is, 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 is this statement right here. 
is because every time that there's a, a, a red moon or a pandemic or a war or a Democrat becomes president, we think this is it. I'm going to insert so many humorous things just in there just to make sure you're awake from time to time, okay? So that's just, just know that that's coming, okay? But right, I mean, every time, every time there's a red moon or a pandemic, a war, I mean, we're like, this is it, this is, this is it, this, it's going to happen. It's, this is, it's coming, this is it. I mean, I remember, I mean, I'm, I'm in my 30s, okay? And I even remember in my own lifetime, Times and events that took place where we thought, like, this is it. This is, what, this is when it's going to happen. I, I remember at 9-11, okay? Um, I remember at 9-11 that, you know, we had this terrorist attack on, 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 the, on the towers. And then I remember there was this conversation. It wasn't days later where, you know, news articles and stuff. They were talking about, you know, safety and security of airports and stuff. And there was this article that came up about the possibility of microchip peop- microchipping people. Putting a microchip in their hand that would have their passport and their ID and their credit card and all of their information. And I mean, even me, you know. I was in seventh grade when that happened. Even me in seventh grade, I was like, that's the mark of the beast. I bet you it says 666. We're all going to die. This is it. This is the beginning of it, right? I mean, this is the end. And there were a lot of people who did that. And by the way, I've double checked. None of you are microchipped. Okay, I don't think anyone's microchipped. You walk through a detector at the door. Okay, that's actually not a hand sanitizing station. It's a it's a it's a beast beast marker indicator. Okay, none of you have been. But did you know in Sweden, this is like very popular in Sweden. All of Sweden is microchipped right now and they're definitely going to hell. We'll get to that later. But anyway, um, but I even remember back from that. Remember Y2K? Anybody remember Y2K? Right. I mean, at midnight when the millennium changed, Jesus was coming back, right? I mean, the computers were all going to go down. Skynet was going to turn on. We were going to have to fight the Terminators for the next 20 years for, before Jesus came back. And when Jesus came back, he was going to be like, Arnold, he's going to come with me if you want to live, right? I mean, we all thought that that's how it was going to go down. I mean, it doesn't matter. Every time there's an event in this world that we don't understand, Whenever there's a change that we don't understand or when there's something that doesn't exactly line up with what we believe or what we think, we think this is probably it. This guy is probably the Antichrist. That is probably the mark of the beast. And so we have a lot of ideas. And that's that's really the thing. Right. I mean, we don't just think, you know, about we we think we know how it's going to happen. But we also think we know uh, when it's going to happen. And we think we know who it's going to happen to. And we, we think we have it all figured out. And that's one of the things, man. I mean, as I, as I, as I did my research over this, and I, and I read every side you could possibly look at. I mean, I listened to podcasts. I watched movies. I read books. I mean, I, I listened to everybody that I could possibly listen to. And I mean, we just think we have it so figured out. And we, we, we think we know where it's going to happen, who it's going to happen to. And we think we're so sure. Some people are so sure about when it's going to happen and how it's going to happen. And, and, and here's, here's kind of uh, where I, I've landed on this and really what brought this up. Like, that made me think like as a pastor, like I've, I've got to talk about this. I've got to bring this up. It's because as things happen in this world... As, as trying times come up, as, as, as things occur in, inside of our country or outside of our country or, or even globally, there's, there's so much fear within us all, right? There becomes this fear. This becomes this unknown. And, and there's been so much done on this topic. There, like I said, there's been books, there's been movies, there's been podcasts and all these different things. As these things have come out, it's really built up this, this fear in us where we're, we're afraid. We're afraid of the return of Christ. I mean, I, I, I talked to somebody recently, you know, again, after the year we've just had, right? We've just dealt with a year of, of COVID, right? This last year of COVID and now vaccines are available and stuff. And I literally talked to a woman a couple weeks ago who she, she said, you know, my mother, she's, she's older, she grew up in the church, and she really should get the vaccine. It would be what was, is best for her health. She really should get the vaccine, but she's afraid to, Pastor. And the reason she's afraid to is she believes that it's the mark of the beast. 
She believes the vaccine is the mark of the beast. And so she even wants to get the vaccine, but she's afraid that if she does, that when Jesus comes back, that Jesus will leave her behind. I mean, isn't that absurd? You know, I mean, isn't that just wild to believe? And I mean, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not promoing the vaccine or anything like you, whatever your choice is on getting the vaccine or not getting the vaccine, that is totally up to you. That's your freedom. That's what the great thing about our country. I got the vaccine and I'm fine. I mean, sure. Every time I walk by a television, it glitches for a little bit, but I don't think that's really what it is. Um, but I mean, that's not what I'm talking about. The, my point is, is that somebody who, who thinks that this is even what's best for them has chosen not to because they're afraid. Because they're afraid that this, this could be the mark of the beast. And oh my goodness, if I get the mark of the beast, we all know what happens. Well, do we really know what happens? I mean, is that really, is that really where we want to go? And, and, and here's, my, here's my biggest problem, okay? Especially in the, in, in, in the church world, okay? Is, is this, is that the good news of Jesus' return, redemption, and renewal of creation has been perverted into a horror film. I mean... Think about that for a minute. I mean, Jesus came to this earth. He died for our sins. Three days later, he rose again. He went, he ascended into heaven. He made us all a promise that he would return. That's good news. That's part of the gospel. I mean, Jesus is coming back. And Jesus is going to return and redeem and renew creation. And somehow, sometime along the way in the last 2,000 years, we've perverted that into a horror film into a series of books that scare people who follow Jesus. And, and that's one of my problems with, you know, the, the, the global church, is that Christians, Christians have weaponized, Christians have weaponized Jesus' return. I mean, think about that for a minute. We've taken the good news, the gospel, that Jesus is going to come back, and we've, we've weaponized it. We've turned it into a weapon. And I mean, some of you, you experienced this. You know this, right? I mean, you grew up in the church, and I mean, man, if stories of going to hell didn't scare you to Jesus, well, then what else did they use? Stories of his return, right? I mean, it's like we've turned Jesus into Santa Claus. You better watch out. You better not cry. Don't get the mark of the beast. I'm telling you why. Jesus Christ is coming to town. Man, that hurt. <laughs> Haven't gotten that deep in a while. But you know what I'm saying? Like we've weaponized it and we've made it into something that, that people should be scared of. And I mean, even think of that tactic. Think of even that approach. How many times did Jesus, when he spoke to people in the three and a half years that he was here on this earth, how many times did Jesus take tactics of using the stories of hell or the end of times to scare people into following him? Never. I mean, the conversations that even Jesus had about hell or even about the end of times that are very far and few in between. He, he spoke to a small group of people. It was usually the disciples. It was usually the twelve. Never, ever did he ever try to scare people into following Jesus or loving God or loving their neighbor. That was never the point. That was what was trying to be broken. I mean, that's what the law did, right? I mean, the law put this burden on people of what you had to do in order to earn God's love, in order to earn the promised land, in order to earn favor with him. And Jesus goes, I'm changing all that. I'm taking all that away. Yet how many times do you see it in the global church that Christians try to use different tactics to scare people into following Jesus? I mean, it's terrible. And it's not something we see very often. And it's something that we shouldn't use today. So how many times did Jesus really talk about the end times? And, and, and where, where is all of this stuff found? And what is the book of Revelation about? And how's the rapture going to happen? And when is it going to happen? And what's it going to look like? Did Epstein kill himself? We're going to talk about all of these things over the next three weeks. And so you're not going to want to miss a single part of this series. But before we begin this series, I have a couple of mm, ground rules, okay? Now, here's the thing. If you're going to come to church for the next three weeks, you have to adhere to these ground rules. If not, I can recommend a church for you to watch online for the next few weeks, all right? But these are the ground rules of this series, okay? Just so you and I are on the same page, okay? So I have two ground rules. Ground rule number one. This conversation is not essential to our faith. Now, that statement alone bothers some of you. But let me explain why. 
This conversation is not essential to our faith. There are some conversations that we sometimes have in the church that are not essential to our faith. I'll give you a classic example, okay? If you and I had a conversation, we sat down for coffee, and you said, Pastor, you know, I've read the creation story, I've read through Genesis, and I know that there's a lot of symbolism, and I know there's a lot of meaning behind this text and everything, and I don't believe that the world was created in six days. I don't take that as a literal six days. I take that as maybe like it's a, it's a time frame, maybe it was six months, maybe it was even six years, but I don't think that God really created the earth in a, in a literal six days. Now, if you said that to me, I would say, okay. I mean, I believe it's a literal six days, but I understand where you're coming from. And guess what? If you told me that, I'm not going to argue with you. Do you know why I'm not going to argue with you? Be because it's not essential to our faith. If you tell me that you don't believe the world was created in six days, you think it was six years, guess what? I'm not going to tell you, well, you better straighten that out with Jesus because you're going to hell. Okay? I'm not going to do that. If you came to me and were like, hey, man, you know how it talks about Noah's Ark and everything, and the animals came two by two. I think that there were dinosaurs on the ark. I mean, think about that. I would look at you, and I would say, actually, I, I think that's where the dinosaurs were wiped out, and that they were wicked among all the wicked people, and that's where they were actually extinct. See, you never thought about these things, did you? And that's what I think. And you know what? You would look at me, and you'd probably say, you are definitely going to hell, because there were velociraptors on that boat. I would say, that's fine, because here's the thing. Those conversations are not essential to our faith. There are conversations that different denominations have, different things that the Baptists believe, different things that the pa Baptists believe, you know, definitely that the Snake Charming Church believes. And guess what? There are going to be people who are part of those denominations that believe differently than us. And guess what? They're going to be in heaven too. There's going to be Catholics in heaven. There's going to be Baptists in heaven. There's going to be Nazarenes in heaven. There's going to be some of you are probably going to make it. You're going to be in heaven too, okay? And so, <laughs> and so, yeah, oh, good. Good news today, right? But here's the thing. We have difference of opinions. We have differences in even our theology. But that's okay. Because some of these things that we get wrapped up about, some of these things that we argue about, some of these things that we fight about, they are not essential to our faith. There's actually only one thing that's essential to our faith. And that's this. Is that we believe that God so loved the world that he came in human form to die for our sins. And he was raised three days later. And if we pick up our cross and follow him and live out the command to love God and love our neighbor, we too will live forever with God the Father. Now, if you have a problem with that, then I have a problem with you. And I'm going to pray for you. Really, really hard. But as long as we are in agreement on that, everything else is game. Everything else we could disagree on, everything else we could agree to disagree on, everything else we could talk about and have debates about and have really good coffee conversations about. But they are not things that should tear a church apart. Satan, Satan would like nothing more. Would you please put, yeah, Satan would like nothing more than the church to be torn apart over a personal belief that has no impact on the church inspiring people to follow Jesus. You know, Satan, wherever he is, whatever he does, I bet he laughs so often because so many times Satan doesn't even have to do any work because he looks down and he goes, oh, this is brilliant. These churches are being torn apart. Because they're fighting over what color the walls and the carpets are. And whether how loud the worship music is. And if this person got their feelings hurt. And if this person got nominated for this position. This is fantastic. And so you know what? One of the things I want you to understand in this conversation. I am going to challenge you like never before. I mean, I'm pretty challenging normally. And I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to say some things that make you scratch your head. I'm going to say some things that probably offend you. I'm going to say some things that probably just come out of left field. And you're going to be like, I can't believe he said that. But here's the thing. It's all to get you to think. Because that's the thing. I want you to think about it. I want you to think about it. I want you to mull it over in your head. It's important that we do that. These ground rules are here. These ground rules are here to help us make sure that we have a, a healthy conversation. And because, because here's what I believe so much. A, a faith that has been tested is a faith that can be trusted. 
A faith that has been tested is a faith that can be trusted. And I want to test you. I want to push you. Because I grew up in church. I was a pastor's kid. And you know what? There were things that I was told, here, believe this. And I just took it for granted. I took it at their word, and I said, okay, I'll adopt that. That's what I believe. And then I got to college. I became an adult, and I was challenged on my beliefs. And the moment I was challenged by my beliefs, I was defensive, and I had no clue what I was talking about. I don't want that to be you. I want to challenge you here in a safe place where we can have a safe conversation. I want to challenge you now so we can have this conversation so you can test what you believe. So you can go through and ask the questions. And so that's exactly why we're having this conversation. So we're going to jump into this. That's the ground rules. Everybody good with that? Everybody agrees? Okay. You just verbally signed it a contract. Okay. So anyway, just know that. All right. But here's the thing. We're going to get into this conversation. And the first thing we're going to talk about, it's going to be a little bit shorter conversation because we had to lay some ground rules. But we're going to talk about the tribulation. All right. We're, we're going to talk about the tribulation. And so in the tribulation, if you don't know what the word tribulation actually means, this is what tribulation actually means. Tribulation means troubled times, okay? Simple explanation, right? It just means troubled times. And so actually the word tribulation only shows up in the Bible one time, okay? And actually that's one of the fascinating things you're going to find in the middle of this series is you're going to find that many of these big ideas that we believe that we we think are so true that have got to happen there's usually only one word in the whole Bible that have given us that idea. There's even other things that we believe where there's not even a word in the Bible that 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 word's not even in the Bible. Like the word rapture. Anyway, we'll get to that, all right? But these some these concepts that we've blown up into these big ideas they're not even really even found that often in Scripture. And think about that for just a minute. Just for a minute, just think about that alone. Think about how this huge concept, we were like, this is absolutely true. This is absolutely how it's going to be. How we've all taken that out of one verse in the Bible. How we've taken that out of one place or one thing. I mean, come on, you got to realize that's a little... That's, anyway, we'll get to that, all right? So... This is where actually the word tribulation shows up. It's in Revelations, right? Uh, typically, you know, we all think in times, we think Revelation. So th this is in Revelation. It says, sir, you know. Anyway, that's the little, they, we'll get to that. He said, these are, the, uh, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed the robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. That makes absolutely no sense. Most of the book doesn't. Anyway, we're going to talk about that later, all right? So Revelation, this is where the word shows up. But we get this idea from other places, all right? So let's just put a pin in that. Next week, we're going to dive super deep into Revelation, where it comes from, what it could mean, and we're going to look at it from all angles. But let's talk about what Jesus talked about, because we don't think, even though the word tribulation is here in this verse, there are other places where Jesus spoke where we think that Jesus is referring to the tribulation, Okay, so today we're going to look at talk about tribulation, but we're going to look at what Jesus said about tribulation because that verse right there makes absolutely no sense. Okay, so this is what happened with Jesus. So Jesus was with his disciples and it says some of his disciples, this comes from Luke, by the way, some of his disciples were remarking about how the temple was adorned with beautiful stones and with gifts dedicated to God. So one day they're walking, right? And they see the temple and they're like, man, that temple, isn't it great? It's so beautiful. That beautiful church we built, I mean, just look at that thing. It's the most glorious thing on earth. And it was. It was like the epicenter of their culture and their religion. I mean, I mean, when you thought about following God, you thought about the temple. Because the temple's where you did everything. It's where you, you know, you, 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 you did your worshiping. It's where you laid your sacrifice down. It's where you atoned for your sins. It's where you were forgiven. It's where the presence of God was held. The temple was everything. And so they're walking by there. Look at that temple. So beautiful. My great, 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 great granddaddy, he, he laid that stone up there. He didn't he do a good job, right? And then Jesus, he turns to them and he, he says this. He says, as for what you see here, the time will come when no stone will be left on another. Every one of them will be thrown down. So think about that for a minute. Think about if you were walking over here on, on Boone Street and you're like, look at that anchored hope church over there. We did such a good job remodeling that building. I mean, it was, it was a place of horrors. You should have seen it. And, and we did such a good job of remodeling it. Isn't it beautiful? And then Jesus walked behind him and goes, yeah, it's going to catch on fire one day. Nothing's going to be left. It's going to be terrible. So, I mean, that's basically what they did, right? Jesus was like, yeah, don't get used to it. It's probably going to go away. It's going to get destroyed, you know? Now, think about that. Think about that for just a minute. Think of it. I mean, they would have gone, no. <gasps> 
Because the temple was so important to them. I mean, how do you have church if you don't have a temple? Wink. I mean, what in the world? That's, that's just, oh, that's blasphemy. What in the world would we do? And Jesus goes, yeah, it's not going to last. It's going to get destroyed. It's going to get torn to bits. And this is so fascinating. You know, one of the reasons why I just, I think it's a practical thing to follow Jesus is because Jesus predicted the future. I mean, Jesus predicted the future. He predicted his own death and resurrection. That's pretty impressive. But not only did he predict that, but he predicted the destruction of the temple. And guess what? 37 years later, after Jesus' death, that's exactly what happened. Rome came through and destroyed the temple. And here's what's so specific about that. You see that Jesus says, he says, every, every single stone, will, not one stone will be left on another. Every one of them will be thrown down. What's so ironic is that that's exactly what happened. Is that the Romans wanted to be so sure because this actually was not the first time the temple had been destroyed, but the second time. The first time were done by the Babylonians, but they rebuilt it. And so this time Rome wanted to make sure that it could not be rebuilt. So guess what they did? They not only lit it on fire and destroyed it, but they took every single stone that was stacked on top of another one. And they took it to the farthest stretch of land that they could so that they could not rebuild. It. So Jesus' detail in, in predicting that the temple would not only be destroyed, but that every single stone that is stacked on top of one would be, would be taken apart and taken somewhere else, and there would be no stone left stacked. It all came true. And so Jesus looks at him and he goes, this is what's going to happen. The temple will be destroyed. And of course, I mean, they're, 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 they're curious. They're like, wow. What? And so they say this. They go, teacher. Teacher, please, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they are about to take place? So, of course, you know, like anybody would say. I mean, if you guys heard, you know, Jesus said, well, anchored hope, it's going to be destroyed. We'd go, well, please tell us what's going to happen. Why? Because you'd all try to stop it is what you do, right? And so you're like, oh, please tell us when this is going to happen. And so Jesus replies to him next. He says, watch out that you are not deceived. For many will come in my name, claiming I am he, and the time is near. Do not follow them. Now, Jesus doesn't tell them exactly when it's going to happen, but he starts giving details of some of the things that they are going to see happen around them. And he says to them, let, let, me, let, me, let me give you a little clue here. Guys, here, many people are going to come in my name. Claiming, I am he, I am the savior, the time is near, things are going to get bad. And guess what they're going to try to do? They're going to try to get you to follow them. Man, we don't see that anywhere today, do we? We don't ever see somebody uh, get on the TV and, 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 and kind of look at Christians or conservatives or, or, or even liberal, Democrats look at liberals and go, you guys better follow me, you better vote for me, you better put your hope in me, or let me tell you what's going to happen. You think it's getting bad now, you have no idea. We don't see that anywhere, do we? We don't ever see it. No, never at an election or anything like that. Now, why would Jesus give us that warning? Jesus says, let me tell you something. There's going to be a lot of people in this space, in this time while I'm away, who are going to come, and they know you're afraid. They know you're anxious. And they're going to try to be your leader. They're going to try to be your savior. They're going to say, you better put your hope in me. You better follow me. You better listen to me. You better buy my book. You better listen to my podcast. You better tune in next week because I'm telling you what. Jesus Christ is coming to town. Why do people do that? You know why? It's because fear sells, doesn't it? Oh, fear sells. Fear sells so good. Because when we're anxious, when we're scared, when we're concerned, and somebody knows about it, you had better believe that somebody's going to try to take advantage of that. Somebody's going to try to take advantage of your anxiousness. Somebody's going to try to take, uh, 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 take advantage of your fears. They're going to do that. And Jesus, that's Jesus' very first warning. He goes, look, in the meantime, be weary of these people. Be careful who you follow. Be careful who you trust. Be careful because sometimes even somebody's character can be so anti-Christ-like that you go, well, but they're going to help us. But they're going to save us. 
but, but they're going to make sure that the end doesn't happen. And, and, and the other guy or the other person or the other organization, and this guy, they've got this book or they got this podcast or they got this TV show and they've got these people. He says, oh, be very careful. Be very, very careful because you are going to have so many people come and try to manipulate you. So be weary. Be watchful. Understand that people are going to come and try to take advantage of your anxiousness and your fear while you wait. And then he says to him this. He gives him another clue. He goes, and when you hear of wars and uprisings, do not be frightened. Now again, again, when, when 9-11 happened, I mean, I remember when 9-11 happened, we thought this was it. This was going to be World War III. And if it's going to be World War III, then this probably means this is it. And guess what? If you would go back in time, and some of you, you probably had family members who lived during this time. If you'd go back to World War II, guess what? They thought this was it. There are so many people who believe that Adolf Hitler was the Antichrist, right? I mean, because how much worse could you get than that? I mean, there have been so many times where things have happened in the Middle East, where things have happened in Israel. And we've gone, oh, this is a sign. This is what that one verse means. This has got to be it. I remember there were even people who took the Twin Towers and found some kind of match in Revelations where it talks about two somethings. And people were like, two towers, two somethings. Oh my goodness, this is it. But what does Jesus say? Jesus says, when you hear of wars and uprisings, don't be frightened. Do not be afraid. So guess what? When somebody says, I'm, I'm, this is it, I hear this on the news, guess what? Probably not it. Because Jesus even talked about that, right? Jesus even talked about, like, no one knows what they're talking about. Nobody's going to see it coming. Peter says it's going to come like a thief in the night. Jesus says nobody knows the hour or the day or the time. I mean, nobody knows. So when it's the moment that somebody goes, oh, I think I know, you probably pretty much made sure that they don't actually know what they're talking about. Because Jesus says no one's going to know. And so when you hear of war, when you hear of violence, when you hear of uprising, when you're going through a pandemic, don't think that this is it. Not every bad thing in the world means that, this, that the time is coming. And then he, he, he goes on, and this is what it says next. Then he said to them, Now these things must happen first, but the end will not come right away. Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be... Uh, there will be great earthquakes, famines, uh, pestilences, and various places, and fearful events, and great signs from heaven. And, and then he goes on, and, and he says this. this is a little bit longer. But before all of this, they will seize you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and put you in prison. And you will be brought before kings and governors, and all on account of my name. Now, here's where it gets tricky, okay? So Jesus has said all this, and it seems like he's talking about a lot. There is, there's kind of two sides to this debate here, okay? So again, this is what people are, are, are debating about. There's one side that says that Jesus is talking about the end times and that this is for everybody. This is a conversation for everybody. There's another side that says Jesus this whole time is only talking about the end of the temple. And that's it. That this is a conversation for the disciples and the disciples alone. And that who's going to experience this are the disciples and the disciples alone. This is not a conversation about the end of times. This is just a conversation about what's going to happen over the next 40 years and what the dis disciples are going to witness as the temple and everything changes. And guess what? A lot of these things that Jesus says do happen. That the disciples are persecuted, that most of them are put to death, that there are famines and there are natural disasters and there are all these things that take place. And so people debate, is Jesus really talking about the end times here? Is he really talking about a tribulation that will happen later? Or is he talking about a tribulation that just the disciples will witness in the next 50 to 60 years? Who knows? No one knows. That's the point of this entire conversation, okay? But let's say we just took it as, you know, we took it as, yes, it is about the end times. Because what Jesus says next, and this is why I think Luke wrote this down. Why did Luke write this down so that other people could read it, so that other people could hear it? Because what Jesus says next is applicable to all of us of all generations because we all go through trying times at different times. And so this is what Jesus says next. He says, and so... You will bear testimony to me. 
you will bear testimony to me. Now, that's a little bit confusing and hard to understand. I, I kind of rewrote it this way. In troubled times, your faith tells its story. You all know this to be true. Think about it for a minute, right? It's easy to go, I have faith. I have faith. I have faith. I have faith in Jesus. I have faith in God. I have faith in his glory. I have faith in his mercy. I believe that he's got me. It's easy to say that. Anybody can say that when times are good. But in troubled times, your real faith reveals itself, right? In troubled times, your faith tells its true story. It reveals the truth. It tells us what's really, really up. And so Jesus says, Jesus says this to them, and even if he's only talking about the temple or whether he's talking about the end times, it doesn't matter. This applies to us. When you're in the midst of troubled times, your faith tells its story. And then he says this. Then he says, but make up your mind not to worry beforehand how you will defend yourselves. Or another way to put it is this. Make up your mind now how you will handle yourself later. That's essentially what he was telling the disciples. He was telling the disciples, bad things are going to occur. You're going to go through your own tribulation. The temple's going to be destroyed. You're all going to be persecuted. Most of you are going to be arrested. Most of you are going to die. And it's going to get really, really bad. Now, I've told you that. Spoiler alert. What are you going to do about it? I want you to prepare yourself. I want you to make up your not mind now. I want you to pre-decide the testimony that you are going to bear later. Because when those trying times come, when that tribulation comes in your life, guess what? You bear a testimony. You not only bear a testimony to God about what your faith, the level that your faith is really at, but you also bear a testimony to the world about what God's faith has really done in your life. And so I want you to pre-decide now. Pre-decide how you're going to handle yourself and the faith story you are going to tell later. And then he tells them this. He says, for I will give you words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. And then he says next, he says, and you will be betrayed even by parents, brothers and sisters, relatives, friends, and they will put some of you to death and everyone will hate you because of me. Now that's kind of dark. That's kind of scary. He says, you're going to go through this. But he says this, he says, but not a hair of your head will perish. Stand firm and you will win life. Now, most of us, we hear that, yep, and we go, amen, right? That's good, right? Yeah, you, know, you think, man, that's great. So, you know, things are going to get bad, but God is always going to save us. That's what a lot of preachers preach, right? Things are going to get bad, but God is going to save us. Amen. All right. Okay, well, if you don't know the end of the story, everyone who listened to this died, okay? So, I mean, he says, not a hair on your head will perish. Yeah, but they all died, okay? So you got to understand, like, Jesus wasn't telling them, everything is going to be all right. rock a -bye. right? That's not what he's doing. What he's saying is, is things are going to get bad. A lot of you are going to die. But when he says, but you will not perish, you will win life, he's talking about eternal life. Which what Jesus is saying to you and to I, no matter if we're going through a tribulation now or we're going through a tribulation later, is I want you to pre-decide the testimony that you're going to bear, the faith story that you're going to tell. And here's my promise to you. My promise is not that everything's going to be all right. My promise is not that I'm always going to swoop in and make everything better. My promise to you is that the chapter of this life on the world is very, very short. But I'm promising you, if you pick up your cross, you follow me, you put your faith in me, and you follow my commands. I will help you win it eternal life because I will always have the last word. I will always come in at the end. Nobody will ever trump what I want to do in your life. And in the same way that they tried to kill me and I, God raised me back to life three days later, I will come back for you and I will raise you to, de to uh, raise you to life too. That is Jesus's promise to them and to us. And the disciples took that, and guessed what? They, they bared witness. They didn't understand it until they saw the resurrection, but they, they bared wet witness to his testimony. And, and they lived this life of, of following Jesus and, and, and following the greatest command to love God and to love their neighbor. And most of them died. Most of them were taken, and they were. They were persecuted, 
and they were imprisoned, and they were crucified. But they told a good faith story. And just like Stephen in the book of Acts, Jesus, he gave them words. He he gave them wisdom that nobody could could trump. Nobody could could deny that that something was in them, something that was living, that the Spirit was, was breathing through them. Nobody could deny that. Nobody could take them from that. And they all held on to this hope that Jesus would help them win at life. And so for each and every single one of us, this is, what we, this is what we know for sure, okay? This is what we all know, and this is what a lot of us think, right? When we talk about tribulation, right? We know it, whether, whether, it was, whether it was back then or later or whatever it may be, there will be a, a great time of suffering, and then Jesus re- will return to, to save us, right? Now, the big debate, some of the questions you guys had, right? Because this is a, a debate if you've ever had these kind of type of conversations. Is tribulation, well, did it, did it already happen or has, is it going to happen later on, right? Happened already or hasn't happened yet? This is actually a really big debate. A lot of people believe that the tribulation already happened. That it really was what happened with the temple. It was what happened to the disciples. That it was back then when Nero was the ruler and the persecution that he put Christians through. That that was the time and period that they believed. I had college professors, even at my school for religion at Mid-American Nazarene University, that believed that and told us that. Guys, I already think the tribulation has happened. There are other people who believe, right, because we've, we've all read, like, you know, the Left Behind series and all these type of books and listen to these podcasts that, oh, you think it's bad, it's going to get really bad, right? That the tribulation is later, and we're all going to go through tribulation. And Revelations even talks about that. The vision that John had said that there's going to be a, a really big tri- tribulation, and all these things are going to happen. Nobody understands, right? But he- here's my, this is where I land. And again, this conversation is not essential to the faith, and I'm going to tell you what I believe, Okay? So we've talked about tribulation, right? It means troubled times, okay? Troubled times is all that tribulation means. And that's what Jesus told us. You're going to go through troubled times. Well, here's my take on it. Haven't we been in troubled times ever since Jesus left this planet? Ever since Jesus ascended into heaven, haven't there always been famines and plagues and persecution and wars and terrible things that have happened on this earth? I mean... Haven't we for the past 2,000 years, haven't we been waiting for the return, the redemption, and the renewal of the world? Haven't we been waiting on Jesus? So here's the thing I, I don't think you can get hung up on. If you get hung up on, but things are really bad right now. I mean, I've heard so many people say that. I think Jesus is, is going to come back in my lifetime because things are really bad. Well, let me tell you something. If you think things are bad now, you really need to brush up on your history. Because I can point to so many different times in history where things were so much worse than they are now. And that's the thing, right? I mean, this is why it's so important that we pre-decide the faith story we're going to tell. Because can I be honest with you for a minute? And this is really the application of this message. This last year, a lot of us didn't handle well. Can I be honest with you too? This last year, it really wasn't that bad. I mean, we freaked out because our kids had to spend a little bit of time online and we had to wear masks. Good grief. I wonder how we would handle a Great Depression if that happened again. Because we don't seem to have much, uh, what's a good word for it? I'm not going to say it. Anyway, it doesn't seem like we can handle very much. It doesn't seem like we can handle a whole lot of persecution. I mean, I, when I was in San Diego last weekend, I would got to get together with one of my friends who pastors in San Diego. And they haven't had church for over a year and a half. And you know what? Things have never been better for their church. Because persecution has only made their faith stronger. Because when this all started, they pre-decided the faith story that their church was going to have and their people were going to have. And they're bearing a terrific testimony in San Diego. Because they made that decision. And so the thing is, is when it comes to the tribulation, did it already happen? Or is it going to happen? I don't know. Nobody knows. But you know what? In each of us in our lives, there are going to be trying times. They're going to be troubled times. You know what? Some of you are going through a tribulation right now in your marriage. And that is a troubled time you should pay more attention to than what's going on on the news. You know what? Some of you are going to go through a tribulation with your kid in the future. Some of us, we're going to get sick. We're going to battle cancer. 
There could be a financial tribulation coming up very soon. I mean, there's so many things that are going to happen in our lifetime to focus on and try to guess how bad it's going to be and if Jesus is going to come back is really kind of pointless, to be honest with you. What matters most right now is that each and every single one of us pre-decide the testimony that we are going to bear. Pre-decide what, what we're going to do, how we're going to handle ourselves. To pre-decide, you know what, whether something happens in the world, whether we go through a pandemic, or you know what, whether something happens in our relationship and our marriage, whether something happens between us and our kids, when something happens to us at work. When we go through that tribulation, we've already pre-decided the faith story we are going to tell. Because here's the thing, if you do that, it really doesn't matter what happens or how bad things get. Because Jesus has got your back. Because Jesus is going to return. And so I, I want to give you some discussion questions, okay? This is kind of what we're going to do this summer since our groups are taking a break. I want to give you some discussion questions of some things you and, you know, your family can talk about in the car ride home and stuff. But here's the thing. Are you hopefully expecting and waiting for Christ to return? Or are you afraid, anxious because of a fictional movie, book, sermon, or podcast you experienced? If you get nothing else out of this series, okay, I want you to walk away not afraid of the end. Because the end is not a bad thing. The end is good news. The end is the gospel. That no matter what happens at whatever point in time, and here's the thing, none of us really know, Jesus is going to return. And that is good news. And the question is, you know, this is so old school. Gosh, this, even saying it bothers me a little bit. But, you know, the question always was at, at teen camps and all these different conventions they had was, are you ready? That's the biggest question. Are you ready? If Jesus did come back today, would you be ready? Are you hopefully waiting and expecting that Christ is going to return and renew and redeem the world? I mean, that should be something we don't fear. It's something we should get excited about. I mean, the next time that somebody says, hey, something happened on the news. I think this is it. You should go, sweet. I've been praying for this day my whole life. Woo. I mean, that's the way we should treat it. That's the way we should think about it. And the second question is this. Have you made up your mind? Have you made up your mind about the testimony you will bear when tribulation comes into your life? Because forget the tribulation of the world for a minute. You're going to go through your own tribulation in life. You're going to go through experiences. And you know, Kate and I, we do this all the time. My parents call me pessimistic. I call myself like Christ. I mean, we think of bad things that can happen all the time. We do. I remember even when we were, when we were pregnant with our first child, Olivia, we had a conversation. I, 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 we sat down and I said, I, I want us to have this conversation now. What if we lose our daughter? Before she was even born, I said, what if we lose our daughter? What are we going to do? I want to talk about it now. How are we going to handle ourselves? And you know what? We had a conversation that if we were, had to go through that experience, and thank God we didn't. But if we did go through that experience, how are we going to handle ourselves? You know what? That's why I try to do with couples in marriage counseling. We try, to, we try to talk about all the things that could happen. What if? What if one of you has an affair? What if one of you makes a mistake? What if one of you loses your job? What if you guys in your marriage, you go through a tribulation? What are you going to do? And most of us, how we handle those conversations are, well, that's not going to happen to us. Well, that's not going to happen to me. Well, come on now. That's a little silly. Anything could happen to every single one of us. We're going to go through our own tribulations in life, and we need to pre-decide the faith story that we are going to bear to God and to the world. Because the faith story that we bear is what he's going to judge us on. And I would think every single one of us, just like Jesus promised, want to win at life. Every single one of us, that's our biggest concern, right? What if I miss the boat? What if I miss the train? What if he comes back and I'm not ready or I took that sticker on my hand? I mean, we all want to win at life. None of us want to miss it. And that, that is great. But don't get so hung up on marks and beasts and people. What you need to worry about most right now is the faith story that you are bearing to the world and to God. 
So I'm going to pray for you this morning. And, I, you know, right now would be a great time to have a conversation with God. To pre-decide the faith story you're going to bear. So will you pray with me this morning? Father God, as we come to you this morning, God, I pray that every single person in this room would bear a good testimony to you, would bear witness to you, would, would choose to have a, a faith story of following you, of putting our faith in you. God, will you help us right now as we, as we wrap up this year and things change or things go back to normal. God, there are going to be other things that are up ahead. There's going to be tribulations up ahead. Tribulations that only me and my family are going to go through. Tribulations that I'm only going to go through, that no one else is going to go through with me. And God, I want to pre-decide right now the faith story I'm going to bear. God, will you help me to make that that promise to you and, and keep it. God, when I go through my own tribulation and I'm weak and I'm emotional and I'm caught in the moment, would you help me to bear a good faith story? God, would you give me the wisdom? When it happens, would you remind me, ah, oh, this is it, this is that time, this is crucial, this is so important. And would you help me to do that? Would you help me to have hard conversations with my kids and or my friends, my family, with my with my spouse of saying like, hey, if we ever go through this, if this ever happens to us, I want to make sure, I want to make sure that we we bear a good story, that we tell a good faith story. I want us to, I want us to handle this well. I want us to hold on to our faith. I want it to matter. I want us to win at life. If we ever go through that, would you help us to win, God? Every single one of us, that's our concern. That's why we, we fear this. That's why we're anxious about it. It's because we don't want to miss out. We don't want to miss our opportunity. We don't want to miss our chance. But God, the truth is, is that every single day we go through tribulations and every single time is, a, is an opportunity to bear witness to you and to other people. So whether we get cut off in traffic when we leave here or we have a disagreement with a neighbor or we, we fight with family today, would we treat this as just as important, God? Would we give this the, the weight that it deserves? Would you help us to bear good witness today and every single day? God, that's our prayer and that's our hope. Would you help us to do that, Lord? In your name we pray. Amen.
that God will go with you and that you will be a light in dark places today.